it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and today we are presenting from two different spaces in Cairns. There's me and uh, Jenny. This is uh, Jennifer Nichols. Um, and I'm Snowy Evans. And Hillary would be with us, except Hillary has been caught sick. So I'll let, uh, I'm senior lecturer here and I have worked with Hillary for, I'll just give you a quick background. So I've worked with Hillary for, oh, I can't even remember, but she took me under her wing um, very early on. And so she was my supervisor um, during my PhD and during, before that in my honours work. Um, and she has also been um, Jennifer's, uh, Jen's um, supervisor as well. So I'll let you, Angela, Okay, I can introduce myself. My name's Angela Colliver and um, I have, I guess, been a member of A Squared E Squared for many, many years and had the greatest pleasure this year of writing an article for Hillary when she was convening um, a whole selection of articles for the Australian Curriculum Studies Association in their journal called Curriculum Perspectives. So the April 2017 edition is the edition where um, our articles feature and this has led to the learning circle today. I'm a director of my own company, and I guess education for climate change has been a passion of mine for many years. Uh, in a previous life, I was the manager of a CSIRO program called Carbon Kids that was really engaging most Australian Aussie or Australian Sustainable Schools in tackling climate change. Um, since that time, I've written a whole range of educational resources for the Climate Reality Project, which is Al Gore's um, Inconvenient Truth project here in uh, Australia. And I was thrilled on Facebook today to see Calendilla Primary School. That is actually a climate change specialist school featured in one of his very, very most recent videos that came live this afternoon. So there you go. Lovely. And Jen? <laughs> um, I'm Jen Nichols and um, I completed my PhD research at the end of last year and I researched Queensland teachers and their understandings of climate change and climate change education and what's happening in Queensland schools and I'll be talking about some of that data today and I now work at JCU as an ASM lecturer and, um, and still researching in climate change education. It's me. Lovely, thank you. So moving forward today uh, we're going to be talking about climate change education. Obviously, I'm going to talk about um, the dimensions of climate change education, which is around resilience, adaptation, mitigation, were, which were concepts that were very closely linked in my PhD research, which was in sustainability education in schools. And so apply, and at the time when I did my PhD, climate change wasn't as hot a topic as it is now. So we weren't really talking about education for climate change still but it's uh, you know it's, it's kind of moved on to that nicely um, and then Angela will be talking about uh, the curriculum and how we can actually map climate change um, and she's got a lot of insight into that in terms of curriculum area from her work and then Jen will be talking about um, her very interesting PhD study uh, with teachers uh, and climate change education and, and what that actually means. Um, and then finally, we'll have a discussion with, um, with, with all of you where, where you can, uh, we can talk about the pertinent things that are relevant to your own context. So an introduction in terms of the importance of education for climate change. So we know that in the context of uh, global rising temperatures, that we're, we're feeling the effects of warmer, warmer temperatures, warmer sea level temperatures, as well as um, air temperatures, and the effects that that have had that we're seeing. Um, very visual effects like ice sheets that are already melting and progressively causing uh, problems um, globally um, and so as a consequence yet the changes in uh, precipitation patterns that are leading to things like uh, heat related deaths and um, particularly as we know amongst young children and old people and for us in Australia a very relevant issue of biodiversity loss. So we come to the question of what can we do as educators? 
And one thing, not only in education, but within um, sustainability, environmental education, uh, broadly around the sustainability, they, there's a lot of talk about resilience, adaptation and mitigation. So they're kind of the three characteristics, I suppose. So resilience in, in a generic sense is the ability of a system, any type of system, to be able to manage change and still thrive or if not thrive to keep moving forward. So when we're faced with adversity, yeah, it's the ability to keep moving forward, whether that's in a social sense like us as people or we also talk about ecological systems and, and the eco ecological systems resilience, level of resilience. So, for example, if a system is resilient, then it's able to withstand change really well and keep moving forward. Um, if it's very resilient as well, it'll even thrive in the face of adversity. So this is where you see um, uh, opportunities for taking advantage of change. Yeah, so you will take advantage of changing circumstances. So I'll give you an example that we, I'm sure we're all familiar with, and that's weeds in your garden. I don't know about you guys, but it seems to me that as soon as they can possibly take a hold, they're taking, they take advantage of um, conditions. You know, if it's really, really dry, all your grass will dry up and then the weeds will start to feed through. And yeah, so that's kind of a, a very simplistic example, yeah? In the context of climate change, uh, resilience can apply to ecological, so earth systems, social and economic systems, so uh, which will all be affected by climate change. So for example, um, if you have a seaside community, it's their, about their capacity to withstand or to not collapse even in the face of, for example, rising sea levels or floods that may come from rising sea levels. So that will define their um, level of resilience, yeah? So, and in turn as well, the community's level of resilience will be affected by its economic and social circumstances. So if there's, for example, if there's money in the coffers of that community, then the community is more likely to be socially cohesive. Now, a community that's socially cohesive is more likely to have resilience, yeah? So, um, it will because simply because it'll have resources that it can draw upon, okay? So, that's kind of the broad um, resilience term, concept, and it has a number of important subsets, which are mitigation and adaptation, which I'll, I'll um, briefly explain now. So adaptation is about being able to respond to changing conditions. So basically just making changes. So if I take a resilient community, it will be able to take actions that will enable that community to adapt and change in order to keep moving forward if it has high adaptive capacity. So in this way, as well, the community's vulnerability to adverse effects will be decreased. So putting it in the context of climate change then, a community that has adaptive capacity will be able to make changes to prepare for and into some um, effect it may even be able to negate the effects of climate change. So in turn, it will also reduce the community's vulnerability to the effects of climate change. So um, in this way, a community's capacity to adapt will build their level of resilience. So the benefit of adaptation is that it will increase resilience. However, it's a term that's been um, heavily resisted by many environmental educators because um, it implies that we somehow need to live with rather than try to prevent climate change. Okay, so that's always a really interesting intersection. And up until a few years ago, um, adaptation was a term that was somewhat resisted. Um, 
So I'll leave you to think about uh, that idea. And the last concept um, that's relevant is that of mitigation. So it's really about the ongoing effort to lessen or minimise the impact of adverse effects. Yeah, so if we're trying to mitigate the effects. So in this case, in, in climate change, um, mitigation strategies aim to avoid that climate change becomes unmanageable. So this is kind of, so for example, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about here efforts to lower the CO2 levels um, by, you know, for example, in our case, um, changing inefficient or harmful practices. Um, also things like reducing energy, uh, reducing emissions by energy efficiency measures. So the theory behind mitigation is that um, fewer people and communities will be affected if we can mitigate for climate change. So, however, it's a really messy kind of space to play in because um, there are lots of different mitigation strategies that are context dependent. So it can become quite complex, you know. So, for example, for people living in the tropics, it's about, um, you know, storms or, or uh, cyclones. For people living in southeast Queensland, it can very well be about storms and storm surges and those sorts of things. Um, but m primarily the idea is about taking action now before the effects of climate change completely overcome us. So it's about reducing consequences. Um, so we're talking about dealing with the causes of climate change and works to reduce um, the effects of that. So um, it's really critical because it's got clear policy implications. And this is the one space that policy has a very clear role. Yeah, and, and so a lot of the strategies that we hear are really relevant, uh, related to the idea of mitigation. So uh, in concluding this introductory section, thinking about climate change in uh, education, the integration of adaptation and mitigation concepts or responses into education of young people or adults, if in the case that you're working in community education, can certainly help to build resilience and to enhance pathways in the face of the effects of climate change. So um, it's believed that this will involve new knowledge and new sorts of skills than what we're doing currently in many school situation and really changing the way that we do things. And um, to give you some ideas of how we might do that, I'll um, move, hand it over to Angela. Thanks, Noe. I'd like to have to support that because last year, um, Kranzi and Debo actually said very clearly in a lot of their writing that there is a need for a more holistic and pedagogically relevant and integrated approach to teaching and learning that addresses the science, definitely of climate change, as well as mitigation and adaptations, but very much so that um, in ways that are developmentally appropriate for a diverse range of students across a range of age and year levels. So what I find really, I guess, interesting and of crucial importance um, in regards to climate change education is that needs to be for all years of schooling. And when I explore the Australian curriculum and how it engages young people in education for climate change, I must admit, um, I was quite surprised. Because as the slide says, you know, there is so much information freely available online. And that means that teachers and their students can access it. But that extent to which educators are using a range of scientific sources we don't yet know. So a really interesting question, perhaps for a budding uh, research topic and uh, for PhD students out there. Thanks, Noe. So um, when I actually looked at the links in the Australian curriculum, I searched the term climate change and it revealed 42 results. But the majority of these curriculum links are only in the humanities and in geography and in science. Those result, results actually showed that there were two primary science links. There were seven primary human uh, has links or human and social sciences links. 
One secondary media arts link. Would you believe one secondary French, one secondary German link? There was a secondary Hass link, two secondary history links. And when going to the senior years, there were four secondary science links, four secondary geography, and in the senior uh, secondary years, two geography and seven senior science links. Not what I would have expected, especially as someone who writes curriculum. I would have hoped a lot more junior primary and primary materials might have been found. But they were actually the results using that online search function in the Australian curriculum. Thanks, Zoe. These results um, can be categorised in a whole range of ways, as you can see, but from my perspective, that's really a, a bit of a poor way of supporting teachers who are really passionate about engaging their kids in the science of climate change and the adaptation and the mitigation approaches that can be undertaken, especially in junior primary and primary schools. Thanks, Zoe. That's Snowy. In the learning areas, when I delved deeper into the Australian curriculum, a lot of the elaborations provide us with a context to explore climate change themes. And we've got a few of them on the screen there for years four and year five. We're exploring how climate and landforms influence human characteristics and places. And we're exploring climate types. But for me, that's not what climate change is all about. When we look into the Australian curriculum in science as a human endeavour from year three onwards, though, I think there are some exciting opportunities there and they're limitless ones for us to actually engage in looking at real life science and scientists who are engaging um, their research and that research can be used to empower and to inform young people about climate change learning experiences. Thanks, so, uh, Snowy. When we go further, though, it's the general capabilities that I think offer us the most hope. If we're looking for content, I really don't think we'll find it. Um, for me, as I say, they, it's puzzling that because this is such a real world topic that we don't make an explicit men mention of it. But when we think about the critical and creative thinking, general capability, and the ethical understanding capability, there's some real hooks there. Because in the Australian curriculum, it explicitly acknowledges that responding to the challenges of the 21st century, with its complex environmental pressures, requires young people to be creative, innovative, enterprising, and adaptable, with the motivation, confidence, and skills to use critical and creative thinking purposefully. If this is something of interest for you, I'd encourage you to look at the Australian Science Teachers Association website, asta.edu.au. Last year, I wrote the National Science Week materials, sorry, for this year, I wrote them last year, for Future Earth. And that has so many opportunities to embrace climate change education using this general capability, in addition to um, ethical understanding and personal and social responsibility. So I think... The best climate change education can promote that independent and critical thinking and the capacity to appreciate that there are so many points of view and different interpretations and the way that climate change is communicated, um, we need to look at those substantiated arguments. And I think sometimes we you know, have to go even further in asking ourselves, you know, how and what media literacy skills do students need to evaluate evaluate the reliability of a new source. That's the sort of hook that I think we can use through literacy in particular, using also another general capability to embrace education for climate change. Thanks, Noe. Ethical understanding, I sort of brought to your attention as well here. This capability really promotes building a strong personal and socially orientated ethical outlook that helps students to manage, be it a climate change context, a climate change conflict or an uncertainty and to develop an awareness of the influence that a student's values and behaviours in environmental for, uh, education for sustainability can really have on others. It's a really complex um, area but once again I have seen so many primary and junior primary people, teachers, do this brilliantly and I'll, I'll reiterate, have a look at South Australia's Calendilla Primary School on their Web, uh, Facebook post today, the video that they've um, launched as part of their climate change education program 
is a lovely hook and a starting point for teachers to actually embrace this. Thanks, Zoe. When we go into the cross curriculum priorities, I think we can always see that link with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, CCP, because there are limitless opportunities here to integrate climate change learning and experiences as well. Um, their connection to country and place, their economic, their spiritual and their aesthetic value of place and their idea and very much their value of custodial responsibility can contribute to our climate change education priorities. And their ongoing and long-term as First Australians ability to sustain the environment, I think this, they their central concerns for all of us involved in climate change education. If we haven't considered them before, I hope we might now. The second one, thanks, Snowy, is quite obvious, using the sustainability cross curriculum priority. Once again, um, there are lots of resources on the Getting Started with Sustainability Education website um, that and can enable you to use this cross curriculum priority to investigate and explore climate change education. And in fact, when I look back to my notes, I think there are over 80 resources on that website for climate change. So the organising ideas of this cross-curriculum priority offer us so many ideas with which to frame our climate, educa climate change education programs. And I think one of the most crucial things for us to do is to use those cross-curriculum priorities organising ideas to assist us in designing action for sustainability. Um, so if you are not familiar with that table, I'd sincerely encourage you to investigate it. Thanks, Snowy. We can evaluate past practices, we can um, assess scientific and technological developments, and we can use futures thinking to actually analyse the economic, the social and the environmental impacts of this real world topic. So I mentioned that um, I delved deeper into other portals. Scootle is one that I'm sure you're very, very um, aware of. There are many narratives in Scootle that enable teachers from a range of year levels to find developmentally appropriate climate change education resources. In fact, there are 367. Many of those, I'd have to say, are embedded in resources that are typically considered in this space, but also there are many links to a whole range of agricultural areas that address climate change and the education materials that are developed for that space are included in that um, scoping for what can be found on Scootle. Thanks, Noe. We mentioned, or oh, I mentioned uh, getting started with sustainability. There are 80 resources there to assist you if you are a passionate educator about embracing and integrating climate change education into your program. And these were found for the year two, right through to the year 10 years of schooling. Thanks, Snowy. For me, I think the next few slides are the most vital ones. That gives us an analysis of what's actually out there. But we need to use our power. And I think as educators, be it in a community context like Lorraine Larry, in an adult education context, in a school's context, um, there are so many ways that we can continually seek to challenge ourselves and the people we work with to really ask and pursue those significant questions. If we do choose to use resources and approaches that ask questions about what we can be doing to tackle climate change, then I think we're enabling a discussion, a dialogue about the issues and we can really explore the ideas in a supportive learning environment where those relationships are caring and trusting. And one of the most exciting things I sort of found recently was a young woman, and I believe this is happening in Cairns also after speaking to Hillary. We have a, a whole range of people um, who are holding climate change dinner parties and having conversations. I think the young lady's name is Katerina Gator in Melbourne. She facilitates, facilitates climate change dinners in and around Melbourne to show people the political impact they can make as citizens. And I think it's those informal chats that are part of the scope, learning to really 
know what questions to ask and to pursue those conversations in that caring and trusting framework. Um, anyone that we're working with, I think those environments need to also embrace the global and the local issues. And Hilary McLeod was hoping that we might have some people join us from Tuvalu this afternoon. And that would have been wonderful because issues that are involved in climate change, of course, are going to affect all of us personally. And we're all trying to act for that sustainable future for both our local communities and our global communities. So this is where going back to that science-based, whatever we are sharing needs to be substantiated with scientifically based knowledge. And we need to support our students, the adults we're working with, or the communities to discover that cause and effect and challenge that denial that is out there to realise some of the transformations that are required and some of the wonderful creative um, and grow, growing opportunities we have. There was another exciting opportunity, Tim Silverwood, I think I again mentioned this to Lorraine Larry recently. He's a young man who's an oceans campaigner and he's bringing awareness to our wasteful consumer habits with a Take Three program. Um, a very simple idea of when you're on an ocean or a waterway collecting and taking home three, piece of three pieces of rubbish. We also have Paul Hawken at the moment, whose book Drawdown actually describes 100 of the most substantive solutions to climate change. You never know, could just be one of those manifestos of our time. Thanks, Snowy. So again, to use our power, if we are going to tackle climate change at all effectively, and I'll go back to the school context here, then the curriculum does need to provide students with the contemporary knowledge, and it needs to enable students to address areas or issues that are related to it. But more, most importantly of all, it has to maximise that likelihood that students will care and become climate change agents. So um, in this space, we've got a lot of uh, um, materials out there, but it's our approach to how we can implement something so real world and not just encourage people and students in particular to understand climate change, but for me, acting for it, if it's adaptation or mitigation, is really the most important things. Because um, we can, we can be those initiators and those drivers to not just enable people to understand, but most importantly, to act for a sustainable future. So there's some of the areas that are covered in that paper in Curriculum Perspectives in April. Thanks, Angela. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about some of the data I found um, in my PhD research. So I surveyed and interviewed a number of Queensland teachers um, as part of my PhD research and I was interested in understanding what teachers knew about climate change, that is what their knowledge about the issue was, but also what they thought about climate change, so what their beliefs were about the issue. And then I was also interested in how these knowledges and beliefs influenced um, how climate change was taught in their classrooms. So um, today I'm just going to run through some of the data and then at the end we'll have a discussion hopefully where we can hear some of your experiences. So firstly and encouragingly, um, the majority of teachers I surveyed stated that climate change education was either a priority or a high priority for them. Um, however, this priority did not in most cases translate to good or any climate change education um, in Queensland schools. And there appears to be a number of reasons for this, but I'll get to that a bit later. But before we discuss the reasons, um, Queensland teachers appear to be reasonably knowledgeable about climate change science. So compared with the Australian general population, which is the three columns on the right of this table, um, Queensland teachers um, appear to be slightly more knowledgeable. So you'll see the yellow is the correct answers. Um, and encouragingly, the teachers I surveyed at least were not conflating the hole in the ozone layer with climate change, which um, is a common misconception amongst a lot of people. Um, and also, uh, the majority of teachers were certain that climate change is actually happening. Although close to 20% of the respondents tended to or strongly disagreed with the statement that climate change is happening. So there still is a portion of teachers that don't think that climate change is happening. 
So when it comes to the causes of climate change, by far the majority of respondents believe that humans were at least partly the cause, with 37% of respondents indicating that they believed that climate change was mostly caused by humans. Although around 18% of respondents either thought was totally caused by natural processes or almost entirely caused by natural processes. So still a significant number of teachers that um, don't accept the science of climate change. Um, anyway, despite these numbers, um, there appeared to be a large amount of confusion and uncertainty about climate change amongst teachers. So this quote here exemplifies some of the confusion um, from teachers when talking about climate change. Um, many teachers that I interviewed didn't feel comfortable in saying that climate change was definitely happening and that humans were a contributing factor. So in the survey, they might have ticked that's what they believed when I asked them to actually state that out loud to me. Many of them were quite hesitant um, in stating that that was the case. So there's still a lot of confusion and um, uncertainty. Um, and as mentioned earlier, the second part of my research was interested in how these understandings of climate change influence the teaching of climate change in Queensland schools. So are teachers teaching climate change? And if yes, what are they teaching? So firstly, teachers think of climate change in terms of science education or the science of climate change. Um, teachers see climate change education as helping students to understand um, what's happening with the science basically. Teachers mostly think about climate change in terms of increased CO2 or increased temperature and therefore when they think about climate change education these are the kind of things that they think about teaching. Um, and also within the terms of science education teachers believed it was important to provide a balanced approach to that science education. So the purpose of this balanced science education for, was for students to be able to decide what they believed or to pick a side. Um, very few teachers spoke of climate change education in terms of the imp implications of climate change on the world um, or for developing adaptive, resilient future citizens who are able to work with, uh, with the uncertainty. It was really um, in terms of science education, providing a balanced picture, so a for and against argument about climate change and asking students to be able to pick what side that they um, would like to belong to. Um, and although, as mentioned previously, teachers believe that climate change education was a priority for them, very few teachers include climate change in, as a planned unit of work. So most often climate change is included in lessons as part of incidental or informal conversations when it just comes up as part of something else that they're doing in their classrooms. Um, when questioning teachers why they were not including climate change in a more formal way, many teachers responded that climate change is just not in their curriculum. Um, and they teach what their curriculum tells them to teach and they don't have time for any extra content. Um, this is especially problematic as teachers do not see climate change education as anything other than climate change science. So there may be many avenues, as Angela has pointed out, where climate change could be included, but teachers don't or won't see those links because they don't see climate change as anything other than this sort of science education. Um, so when the teachers did include climate change, I asked um, where teachers sourced their information and teachers predominantly said they used Google as their first step when they were looking for information about climate change. And the second avenue was talking to other teachers, um, family members or friends. So very few used uh, scientific uh, data websites like the CSIRO or the IPCC. Many just Googled and hoped for the best. Um, so briefly, the implications um, of this is that climate change education is either not happening or happening as part of limited science lessons on the carbon cycle or increased temperatures. Um, and teachers feel that climate change education is important, but it's not something that appears in their curriculum and they just don't have time for the extras. Um, here you might be thinking of the cross-curriculum priority as an avenue. Um, however, when I did my research, many teachers didn't know that the cross-curriculum priorities um, existed, let alone that they could um, engage with them. And the ones that did know about the cross curriculum priorities, most of them said that they didn't influence their planning decisions at all. So um, I'm interested in hearing other people's experiences. My research was done um, a couple of years ago now, so things may have changed. Um, and hopefully through this discussion, we'll hear some positive stories. And so I think I'm handing over to Angela now to start the conversation. Is that right, Angela? Or am I putting you on the spot? Yeah, no. No, that's fine. We have a, a few discussion points. And first thing, we were encouraging people to share their thoughts around the capacity um, to embrace education for climate change. So is there a voice out there that might like to share how he or she 
does it or how they know someone else embraces it. Um, yeah, so any thoughts? Well, I'd like to ask people mm -hmm. to appreciate that right now the ACARA, the Australian Curriculum Assessment Reporting Authority, are workshopping what they what or they want to hear from us, what we believe the next generation of the Australian curriculum should contain. And um, on the 21st of October, Mark Caddy, the president of A Squared E Squared, and I attended the most recent um, workshop of the Australian Alliance of Associations in Education. And we actually looked at and workshopped what should students learn. We uh, were able to brainstorm and share what students should be expected to know, expected to understand and be expected to do. And it was amazing how many different subject associations did bring up the context of a, climate cha of a changing climate, but also those points of managing risk, resilience and adaptation. So that was an encouraging point. Um, but again, you have opportunities to, I think in the next year, ACARA is visiting all different states and ter territories and jurisdictions, and they're wanting to hear what you believe the next generation of the Australian curriculum should contain. So perhaps we can start there. Do you think the Australian curriculum should contain something more or something different in this space? Is there anyone David, there? David, Hi, here. David. Yeah, my view is the Australian curriculum as it's seen now isn't going, isn't part of the solution. It actually is. It actually needs need, needs to change how we how we see it because we are we are going into a world which is totally different to where it has been in the past, where it is now, and therefore seeing curriculum as subjects isn't the way it needs to be. Actually, and seeing students as receivers of knowledge rather than the creators of, of, of futures is different. We've actually, we actually, and, and I, I just find that uh, when, when I look at the, uh, the uh, cross creek and priority of sustainability, the thing which to me is the most important part is where it talks about worldviews. And what do we mean by worldviews? And I, I believe that we, the worldviews now, which are driving, the, driving where we are now, is based around an economic worldview. And we are talking a lot about ecological worldview. I've got a diagram I, I can't really show you because, because it's, Oh, no, you can't see it. Can you see that or not? Oh, we can. Please. Well, well, what I'm looking at, you have economic and you have economic and you have ecological. And, and it's those two, are, are, we're, there, we're there in it. And it depends on where, where we are going, where we be. Is it going to be somewhere about ecological or economic? And what, what, are, what are the consequences of where we are? How do we know that? And that's what we should be looking at, understanding how the economic does it. For example, in the New York Times on the 29th of uh, November this year, they actually had a thing about global warming. And, and the topic was how to fix global warming. We can talk to tech, we talk to tech innovators, entrepreneurs and political leaders. So they, when I'm there, they are talking from the economic side. If what will the world be like in the future if the economic area drives where we go? What would the world be like if the economic, sorry, ecological drives where, where we go? And be somewhere in between. And we, living humanity now, will, will have a big say in how it happens. And it's not occurring in us, it's not occurring in our communities very much we just we just we talk basically about economic stuff and i'm just put up a quote on the message too a thing which came from hoverkin 
I think I was just, I was just sending uh, There we, you can see it or not, which came from the, uh, sorry. Can you uh, read it to us, David? I can, and it's up there somewhere where it'll come through. It, it says it is from, uh, it, it is from uh, uh, Stephen Snyder, who came to Adelaide in, in uh, 4th April 2006 as a thinking residence around global warming. And he said that when a number of eminent scientists were asked to nominate the five most pressing environmental concerns facing the world, they agreed that they were ignorance, greed, denial, tribalism, and short-termism. And he added, if ignorance and denial were too close in the meaning, then add blame. And sometimes we, we, we actually have to look, we have to have a look at how, how, how we engage as, as humans. I'd have to support that and I think, you know, we have such an opportunity to collaborate on this issue. Um, it doesn't just have to be about science. Um, you know, we should be in the culture business, not the science business necessarily in this area only because culture has a real opportunity to bring us all together to collaborate in this space. Um, and we could even dare to be bigger than we could afford to be economically, um, if we actually learned how to listen and to enable everyone to be part of that dialogue and narrative. And this is where this um, Paul Hawkins, if I go back to his book, he actually, one of his quotes is, what should you do? Well, he said, depends what lights you up, what resonates, that's what you should do. What should we do? hold hands and collaborate. In other words, make a movement about solutions. And I think that's where, again, if I can go back to my experience in um, the Australian Sustainable Schools Initiative and in the work I saw of this one little school, Calendula Primary School, a climate change specialist school today, they're in the, you know, they're in, I guess, the business about making a movement about solutions. And I think that's what Schneider was also talking about, um, collaborating and making a difference and moving from that economic paradigm. Um, can I jump in there? It's Viv Pierce from Canberra. Please, Viv, it'd be great <coughs> to have another voice. Um, yeah, I'm the, um, the president of the local chapter here. Um, we were asked um, earlier in the year by our education minister, there's a big consultation going on in Canberra <coughs> around the future of education. And um, our local chapter was asked basically to input into the future. And it's basically a, a you know, she's looking for, nothing was ruled out. There weren't any references as such. It's sort of ideas on how to move forward for the future of education here in Canberra. So we're just completing, we should get it in next week, the last week of school. Um, our response and feedback from members. We, we didn't have the capacity to do, um, you know, a huge survey or anything. So it, it's just um, feedback from the members that wanted to give feedback. But um, the, the major things that, that came out of the feedback, I mean, we have a lot of very good sustainable schools here in Canberra and, and um, one of the things that came out is that more um, systematic help needs to be given to the early childhood area um, because basically um, it was felt that that was an area whereas our, our actual schools are supported by our AxSmart school program, um, the early childhood sector and the preschools are less supported and given less guidance. I mean, there are some preschools and early childhood settings that, that are doing quite a good job, but then there are others that, that, that aren't. Um, so that was one of the things that came out from feedback from our members is that more structured um, guidance and support needs to go in there because if you can get that early engagement um, with the environment and with nature, 
um, then you have more engagement by kids later down the track, so to speak. Um, and the other thing to come out is that um, while some schools are, are doing um, a really good job, it's, it's usually around uh, an, an enthusiastic and committed teacher within that particular school and there needs to be more um, mentorship both between teachers, between principals, etc., around professional development so that all teachers have um, a comfortable and, and feel some capacity to include um, stuff to do with um, education for sustainability. As was said before, I think somebody was saying that um, a lot of teachers feel it isn't, um, they're not the person in the school that's doing it. There might be an enthusiastic teacher that runs a, a garden, etc. cetera, but, but all teachers need to realise whether they be, be um, in whatever part of the curriculum they're teaching, there are many opportunities links and I think a lot of the teachers just at the moment can't see that the links and, and, and the professional development, the men mentorship. A lot of people that were talking to said said that um, mentorship, talking to others, and it, 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 it's not only to happen at the teacher, teacher level, but that getting the principals on board is critical to to what's happening in the school. So it's also mentorship of of the principals, you know, examples. So, so basically we've got some really good schools doing some really good things, but to actually make sure that every child in every school, you know, is getting a decent education for sustainability, um, just we need, schools need to keep moving along that line. And the other thing that came out was um, some schools are doing excellent stuff on, on waste and recycling, <coughs> and um, you know, energy audits, that sort of thing. Um, but, and perhaps a veggie garden, that, that sort of thing. But there's less work done on um, biodiversity and use of developing native gardens, you know, wildlife corridors, all that sorts of things that would give um, kids an ability to, to access easily resources just outside their classroom, because often, um, you know, excursions to places like botanic gardens and other sorts of places where they may be looking at biodiversity. Um, you know, for lots of sorts of reasons, organising the excursion, the cost of the school buses seems to be a barrier. Um, so anyway, that's, that's basically sort of summarising some of the things that um, the feedback that we had. So, you know, it's sort of, I don't... It, <laughs> The other thing was that just a lot of teachers, as was said before, are not, do not take, do not realise the cross-curriculum potentials. They might um, participate, say, in Nude Food Day or, um, you know, um, Earth Hour or something like that, some of these one-day things, and that, they think then that ticks the Education for Sustainability box rather than, you know, and I think it goes back to prof professional development at all levels, starting right from the early childhood through of the teachers. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, there's lots of things that are, it's an insoluble problem that we need to keep on, you know, working along. Um, well, this, keep thank you. People. Yeah, thank you for that. While you were actually um, sharing your ACT context, a number of programs were shared called Little Green Steps, in particular from Western Australia, and I think that's been here to the Eastern States. Nature Plays, another one that's getting a lot of media at the moment for the early years. But people were definitely applauding and suggesting very a lot of support for writing professional development. And this is where, once again, when Mark and I attended the Australian Alliance for Education Associations and that meeting last month, um, we're seeing that other associations are, in particular, um, 
able to work collaboratively with ACARA to perhaps consider some of these professional development opportunities. And one of the things we're doing as an executive in the new year is trying to work a, a, a policy and a, um, a position with ACARA to perhaps collaborate on offering some professional development in this space. We know that Northern Territory, our president there, Graham Sawyer, is very passionate about this as well. He's got lots and lots of data um, about teachers in the Northern Territory. And hopefully the questions that have been asked by your system most recently will enable A squared E squared to have some more data to present um, in consul in, um, Collab consultation with um, the getting started with sustainability work that was done by one of our previous executive members as well. There's a lot of data around. I think we need to bring that into one place and start advocating and trying to influence some change to get some monies put towards professional development to support teachers in this space. But what do other people think? I know Lorraine, you had a perspective that just came up on screen. Uh, thanks, Ange. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm writing lots of notes here and, um, and you know, I, I, I'm looking particularly at what happens for adults more broadly. I think we've got so much in place for school education, whether it's being used or not, is, um, is, is it, it will be used. Um, I hate to say it. I'm confident that um, lots is happening in schools. And, and will continue to happen through initiatives like this and through people like yourselves working in schools and working through the systems and ACARA and lobbying and, um, and kind of, you know, un, uh, taking the time to set, set the systems in place. But really, the only thing that changes people, um, and I'm talking very much about adults here, is when things start really hotting up. And I think things are hotting up, and I think adults will um, start grassroots things happening. And, you know, Dave, I think you're... I'm, I'm with you. We, <laughs> we, we need to get angry. We need to change the way people are thinking. Um, and I'm just hoping that um, A squared, E squared and environmental educators can see roles for themselves. I mean, I'm thinking about how, Jen, your research shows that so many teachers um, really don't have the capability to do climate change education because um, they're not, they're still very confused and um, they're indicative of, um, of adults in general. We're confused. Um, I went to the World Environmental Education Congress in Vancouver recently in September and um, David Suzuki was the final keynote speaker and, you know, he was, he was really angry and, um, and he said, Let, let's just get this um, clear in our minds. We live in the biosphere and it's made up of air, water and land. And he said, you know, it's thinner than a layer of glad wrap over a football. And really, what does every human need? We need air for longer than three minutes. Um, if we don't have that, we're dead. We need water for three to six days. If we don't have that, we're dead. And we need food for four to six weeks. And if we don't have that, we're dead. And, you know, it just kind of, I think we've got to get hard hitting about breaking through the, de the denialism and the ignorance and the confusion and, um, and, and somehow create um, a critical mass of collective action. Um, I'm, work, I'm doing some work through um, Shoalhaven, Council at the moment as a community rep on their um, Sustainable Futures Committee and they really don't have the knowledge of how to engage community in grassroots um, activism and, and just to, towards those skills of resilience and adaptation and mitigation. So um, I'm, I'm getting more and more anxious <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you all are too. <laughs> um, anyway, I think that's... Larry, there, that's... Are, there are some positive things as well. And I know, Dave, um, you're very passionate about Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander communities. 
And I was very blessed to meet a young woman recently called Amelia Telford. And she started SEED. And SEED is um, Australia's first Indigenous youth-led climate network. And it gets a lot of support from the, um, I can't think of it now, the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. But what she's being able to do with her communities is um, precious. One of her key quotes is, my job is about connecting with young people who are doing everything they can to create change and to stand up for our communities and our culture. The impacts of climate change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aren't just the severe weather events. It's the actual destruction of our land from the industries that are fueling the crisis. And I know, Larry, you've also been involved in that space with the knitting nanas, and you've been to some of these indigenous lands and you've seen for yourself with clear eyes the impacts that industry is having that's fueling the crisis for our indigenous peoples and their culture. Um, that, that's true, Ange. And in, in terms of the coal seam gas movement and extractive mining, um, I've, I've been to some of the um, coal seam gas fields and the proposed gas field in the Piliga near Narrabri. Um, and, you know, the impact on um, local community and Indigenous culture and land uh, is, is very, very scary. The, not only that, but in relation to the Piliga, it's right on the edge of the Great Artesian Basin. So the contamination of groundwater um, feeds straight into the Artesian Basin. Um, there's, you know, the Liverpool Plains is a flood plain from the Piliga. So forget, forget all the agriculture that's going to happen there. Forget the um, Siding Spring Observatory, which will no longer have its very dark sky because it's right near the Pilica and there's going to be 850 wells um, if Santos go ahead. So, you know, like this this huge, um, huge... Economic framework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, economic framework that, that Dave spoke about um, is, is so so all-consuming and um, it's it's hard to talk about curriculum opportunities for me when I'm seeing these kinds of very pressing issues happening. Thanks. Just on a positive point, and then I'll address one of the points that Claire brought up about the Australian, about a car in a moment. Again, Amelia finished with a lovely quote most recently in one of her papers where she said, I think right now people are just surviving. Our vision is for a world where people can really live and thrive and communities can be sustainable, happy and healthy and be powered by the sun and the wind and also powered by each other. And I hope that's what some of the conversation is doing for everyone who's participating. I believe there's 16 people today. Um, hopefully we can power one another. But Claire, you asked me about whether ACARA is also looking at other countries' curriculum in this space when they're designing the next version of the Australian curriculum for the next generation of students. And they do say that their team is undertaking an intensive long-term program of research and uh, they're collecting and analysing national and international data together with a study of the curricula of high performing countries and systems and that will inform the next generation of the Australian curriculum. They're involved in the OECD's Education 2030 project and they're contributing to that international focus on school curriculum design and one of the quotes they've got here in the paper they shared with us might lead to the next conversation we'll have, they say that typically OECD countries expect individuals to be adaptive and flexible, innovative, creative, open-minded, tolerant, self-directed and self-motivated and be able to take responsibility for their decisions, behaviour and actions as lifelong learners, parent, partner, employee or employer citizen, student or consumer. Thanks, Angela. You're welcome. Thanks. 
So uh, there's a reference to that that I can um, give Natasha and she might be able to put up on the Facebook page, but it's definitely the E2030 conceptual framework, key competencies for 2030. So can we have someone else join the conversation? It's, um, we've got another half an hour allocated for this learning circle. So it'd be lovely to hear from some other people who have joined us today. Perhaps we can take the next point on what are your interests and experiences of climate change. Good afternoon, Angela. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, my name's Lydia. Uh, I'm otherwise known as the Frog Woman, and I'm extraordinarily passionate about amphibians and uh, frog conservation uh, in schools, uh, specifically in primary schools across uh, Australia. And the thought that you um, had before, Angela, about people just surviving seems to permeate um, the conversations that I've been having, especially this year, about people basically, and I'm talking not just in schools, across the board, uh, that there's a kind of empathetic fatigue almost of climate change that there's, there's really not much we can do. That Here's another storm, here's another flood. And I think that... Dave's point about you know the anger uh, is uh, rising. There, there is a there is an indignation, and I'm so uh, thrilled and in awe of what uh, each person is doing here today, because this this is arguably not arguably this is the most important issue of the 21st century uh, of climate change that is affecting uh, not only ourselves but the, the creatures. And so frogs, of course, uh, are used or have been used historically. Uh, as you all know, sort of, uh, you know, for dissection, uh, which I'm loath to say that when I went to school in South Africa, I declined to be a part of. But in schools, you know, uh, children react so wonderfully uh, to, to amphibians. And so my way of, of, of being adaptive or involving children is to really um, involve them directly. That, that is through experiential uh, learning and through experiential teaching and to get them away from uh, the computer, which of course is a wonderful uh, learning aid or tool, uh, and to get them outside and so to create wetlands. And, and one way to do that, I thought, there's only one of me in a classroom, but if I'm able to sort of uh, do a PhD on amphibians and declines, one third of um, our incredible uh, amphibians are teetering on the, brinks, on the uh, brink of extinction. And uh, this, is, this is absolutely horrific terrific so what i've done is written a children's book uh, titled my life is in the toilet uh, it's based on latoria cerulea which is a green tree frog that houses medicinal marvelry it's extraordinary and looking at hiv medicines uh, pain medications uh, it, it's limitless in terms of what frogs are offering us uh, just from a medical point of view to assist human beings but we've ridden on the on the frog's back and so I've written this book, My Life is in the Toilet, but it is based on science. So it's looking at the facts of a frog's life, but also the empathy and how we humans can come in to save the day. So that's an approach that I think can reach out. Yeah, I think, Lydia, many of us would have to agree with that. Um, you know, you protect what you love. That's what we're built to do. And if we're not having these experiences with nature, and in your case, frogs, we don't feel the sense of responsibility to it. Yes, I think with frogs, uh, as opposed to, say, caterpillars or, or other creatures used historically in classrooms, you can see the life cycle. It's quite, quite explicit. But a frog is the metaphor for empathic promotion. And I think without empathy, we're going to be a lost society. So is there anyone else who'd like to add to what Lydia and Dave and Lorraine and our team have uh, contributed so far? What are your interests or experiences of climate change? Hi, Jodie. Hi there. I'm just getting into a better position to say something. How's that? Um, I um, have spent a couple of years. I, I unfortunately missed the um, the earlier presentation. Some reason I've got the times mixed up, so I'm going to have to listen to the recording. So what I'm going to say is not going to be related to what you said, unfortunately. Um, but That's just, fine. Yeah, no, hopefully. <laughs> but 
so apologies for that. Um, I spent a couple of years as a um, on the on the research and communications team for a climate solutions think tank called Beyond Zero Emissions. Um, and before then, I had spent a couple of years as a beginner teacher. Sorry, I'll put the video on now. I've got enough bandwidth. I think I should do that. Um, so, and I did have the experience. It was high, high school science and maths. Um, of year seven students in class in front, of, in front of everyone expressing how scared they were and how um, they're fairly sure from what they know, what sort of, I guess, limited amount that kids can, can feel they know, um, that we're really going to be in, um, you know, we're all going to die, is the way that this year seven girl put it. Um, and even though, you know, uh, science trained, um, I really felt the pressure to, um, to kind of bright side. And because I didn't, you know, you don't want to believe that yourself. You want to be, you know, I'm not an optimist. And yet, you know, and yet, so I could not, I could not say to her, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I don't fully believe that myself. And certainly, if I did, I, I uh, couldn't, couldn't say that to her. So it was the year that um, the climate pause was in the news. Do you remember that? So it was 2014. Um, and so we did some, you know, water capacity studies um, to show how, you know, how water, how the oceans have soaked up a lot of heat and we couldn't show the CO2 so much in the, the experience, but we did a little bit of that. Um, and so that they could then have some physical chemistry and some physical basis for understanding why that was even being considered as an issue. Um, yeah, so after that, um, after that year or two of teaching, two years of teaching, I went and worked uh, um, at the think tank um, and, um, and got a lot of experience with climate solutions. That's what it's all about. And with the COP and, you know, governance, global governance. And I haven't really now had the chance to go back to teaching yet to bring that to it, but I'm really interested in, in how people are doing that, um, how people are bringing climate solutions in to teaching, um, because I think that from the experience I had, I did have trouble finding good quality resources to do that. Um, and I, I resolved to, to contribute to that, um, but I'm still not at that um, haven't written resources yet. I just think it would be, there's so many great things, there are so many great things happening. Um, it can be a bit of a counterpoint to that year seven students question. Now I know that there's a lot happening then um, and all the governance, all the Paris Agreement, that has all happened since then. I think that's a fantastic story to tell. And then on the local level, um, the work that A squared E squared does, um, bringing sort of bringing nature, nature and climate solutions together into kind of one package, I find really interesting. Um, and so wildlife corridors, for example, um, what Victoria is doing with wildlife corridors, I think is really interesting in, involving schools and just providing a bit of extra, um, you know, PD to teachers who might not have much experience with how important that kind of thing is. It might seem like a really little thing that schools can do um, to look after local wildlife. That's really, an, an, you know, it's such a vital one. I think that that local level kind of adaptation, climate adaptation. So if we look at it as solutions and adaptation, then that's kind of pre presents a sort of balanced, hands-on, you know, empathy building. I think all of that is really, really good. Actually Imagine if one of our learnings or a, a whole series of our learning uh, circles next year could be exactly around that, enabling and empowering teachers mm. through, you know, simply joining a conversation uh, like we're doing this afternoon to have some active hope um, so that they can, like Tai Chi or gardening, feel supported and feel mentored and in that process um, be able to do something better. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really important to have a good message and it's got to be, the truth has got to be there as well, um, you know, and this is what we're going to do to help the wildlife around here and this is what we're going to do to get on track and, you know, bend the curve even for the older students, they can understand that. Hmm. Yeah, no, you just have to have that other, the, the hopeful message as well. And be active in, as you said, enabling people to adapt and to take some sort of action to mitigate and feel that they have connection to and be able to um, engage with climate change. I think the most frightening thing I ever did was I went to a workshop where 
we had to go around the room and people called out a word or a phrase that came to mind when they heard, you know, something like, you know, when I consider the condition of our world, I think things are getting and, you know, it was frightening and out of control and dangerous. And it was that's not a purposeful way at all to start mm. a workshop in this space. Yeah, Maybe we right. moved on then to something more positive. What do you see as perhaps your most valued approach to climate change education? Can I just say something to support my fellow ACT person, Jodie? Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that we've done a lot of talking about at our local level in terms of um, improving, you know, the ability to be able to deliver education for sustainability, you know, to every child in every school or every educational setting is around um, making more people realise the connection um, with the arts. Because, you know, we were mentioning before about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island and, the, you know, their, you know, very close links to the land and that. But also, you know, not a lot of people like nerdy scientific stuff, yet historically, you know, but the Aboriginals and, and, and humans have passed stories on through dance, you know, and storytelling. And I think that's uh, these, and, and through art, and that's a creative um, subject area that often people are not linking to the environment and yet it's open there. It, it, it helps people to make that connection and care about the environment, which is vital because um, other, you know, types of critical thinking and that, would, that we were talking about um, will fall on deaf ears unless there is some actual connection to care about the environment around you. I'd have to support that. And please have a look at the United Nations environmental art competitions. They run them every year. And the climate change one, I think, was 2016. And it was a student who was age seven that came up with the most amazingly creative interpretation of climate change and its impact on her community. So they have um, videos and they have teacher resources, but they also have the contributions from countries all over the world. And they can be very, very um, a nice motivating or a nice starting point to looking at this sort of approach with classes and schools. I'm interested if anybody's, um, anybody's working with um, food tech at all at schools across Australia, food technology um, teachers um, working together with, you know, the food gardens. Um, so that side of sustainability, which I think in the next year or two, because of what happened at the Marrakesh COP, um, sort of putting a, a focus on agriculture will become a really interesting teaching resource together with, um, with gardens. I can just add my value again. I've just finished writing a draft for Oz Harvest um, about repurposing food waste. Okay. And these are yeah. food tech teachers, but it's for stage three in the New South Wales syllabus or um, years five and six in the Australian curriculum. So it's looking how food is um, managed in a or grow, uh, produced in a managed environment and then prepared for healthy eating. So they're using excess leftovers and um, wasty food or food that might be wasted and repurposing and creating a whole range of recipes. And that stemmed from a lot of schools having school gardens and not knowing how to use a lot of their excess food. Yeah. And there's one um, on the Australian Pork Limited website called Pork is on the Menu. And I think that was the first one that I actually started to embrace um, I guess, being a consumer and looking at your ecological footprint when consuming and, or pu uh, purchasing a processed product. Mm. But anyone else, can they contribute to what um, Jodie's just asked, if you know of any other resources? No, I don't think so. So maybe there's a little start um, with the Oz Harvest one. So Jodie, mm. you have my email address if you want to check that out, give me sure. um, a call. Sounds great, thank you. So what about some valued approaches to climate change education? That's our fourth little discussion point there. What are some of the most valued ones that you use or that you feel are out there? And could I, sorry, just, it's Hillary McLeod here. 
Please, of course <laughs> I can. I've been a bit quiet, but I realised I realised that I was talking and my microphone was on mute. <laughs> so, uh, can I just That's stick? All right. <laughs> can I just stick with the interests and experiences for just one slightly little bit longer? Please do. Um, oh, two. My background, two, two sort of experiences and areas of interest. One came from theoretical perspectives very early on because I was lucky enough to um, study under um, Hubert Lamb who started the climate, climate research um, unit, climatic research unit at the University of East Anglia in England back in 1978. And they were the people who, um, you know, had collected the longest sort of set of data on climate change in the world. Um, they were also, uh, of course, responsible for that email um, scandal <laughs> at one point with the with the data, which we'll, we'll forget about all of that. But I think the most um, uh, the most important or the the most in my face experience of climate change. You mentioned that we we may have been lucky enough to have some people from Tuvalu joining us this afternoon. But I actually, I lived in Tuvalu for um, a couple of years and worked over there. And I think that when you are working in a country like that, which is the, one of the most vulnerable countries as far as climate change is concerned, that, you know, the canary and the gold mine as far as, as, far as it goes to that equity issue of, of recognising or seeing the impacts of climate change first and foremost, it's really um, in your face basically every day of the week. So as I travelled up and down the island on an island that was 400 metres wide at its widest point and five metres above sea level, um, you do get the sense of it's here, it's now. And so the, the Tuvaluans were basically talking about and trying to get action on climate change for a lot longer, I think, than anyone else. But uh, it, just as a case study of, of their empowerment was, of course, working smart in political sense, um, once they had actually got some money through selling off their domain name, .tv, on the internet, they bought themselves a seat at the United Nations and through the United Nations. So they were equal partners then. So one, one country, one voice, basically, on the United Nations as far as that's concerned. And since that time, have been able to advocate and make great changes in raising awareness of the impacts of climate change, not just on Tuvalu and the people there where, you know, the impacts are basically from your ancestors disappearing in, in the sea from, from the grave sites to, you know, seawater impacting on your, um, on your, what little agricultural land there is. Uh, and um, even back in 2014, experiencing a world, uh, sorry, an island-wide drought where they actually had to ship in water and queue up to collect water from New Zealand. So, uh, you know, in the face of seemingly not being empowered to do anything, being a very, very small country and not very powerful country, have become a very powerful country and have a great voice in terms of climate change. So in terms of the next question, what do I see as my most valued approaches to climate change education? I've, since my time there, I've just continued to educate people about Tuvalu and climate change and speak up and advocate and lobby and do everything in my power to make sure that people don't forget that no one forgets about the people of Tuvalu and what they're doing, what they experience. Thanks so much, Hilary. I had the pleasure of, um, I guess, representing the Australian government many years ago, and some of the passionate educators from Tuvalu were, or Tuvalu were, mm -hmm. um, yeah, experiencing it every day, every moment. So many communities had been displaced and uh, yeah, yeah. relocated yeah well of course they, they, they were they were called the first environmental refugees basically they're actually trying to claim or, or advocating for refugee status in New Zealand and Australia um, to give them refugee state status in, on an environmental back basis and that was the first time ever um, New Zealand said yes Australia said no. I can't comment there. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone like to build on Hillary's, ex, um, I guess, um, high, uh, insights rather, and share their most valued approaches to climate change education? I just want to see this as a national call. I was wondering, are uh, other, other states um, and, ter and, and territories, I guess, um, 
doing things with mock parliaments. The ACT um, students get to have um, every every school gets a chance to participate in something called the um, the Parliament of Youth on Sustainability. And um, some years it's just about climate, and some years it's the whole of sustainability. Um, yeah, is that something that happens elsewhere? So, look, one of the problems that we have in um, far north Queensland is that we used to have uh, a lot of initiatives like that. And so uh, over the last uh, five or six years, we've really seen a tightening up of uh, teacher freedom. So um, in the face of, you know, um, quantitative um, value, valued quantitative results of tests. Mm -hmm. uh, schools have kind of um, resolved to having very teacher controlled teaching strategies that are taking teachers away from being outside and doing innovative things like the parliament, you know, the parliament of youth at the school level, because that takes up time that could be in the classroom teaching yeah so uh, those mm -hmm. kind of you know like Lydia was saying experimental um, outside work type of um, curriculum pedagogies are really discouraged uh, currently mm -hmm. because uh, to focus on students in the class learning to the point that some teachers in some schools not all but some are being told uh, if they go outside to do an activity, they're being asked, why are you outside? Why aren't you inside the classroom? This is teaching time. Mm, dear. So <laughs> it's not all bad. And so I think, you know, in terms of moving forward, I think, you know, there are lots of resources if you're a teacher in a school. Um, it mm. does there are lots of things happening in lots of different areas and, and there is lots of potential, um, but at the moment it's just the same old things happening. Yeah. I'd like After, to say at A-Squid oh, conferences, we always see a really nice inclusion of young people um, in forums, sharing their experiences, sharing their ideas. I think in many of the programs like the Sarah's Resource Smart Aussie Vic program, the New South Wales Sustainable Schools program, the Aussie ESA program, these young people are brought together, perhaps not in parliaments, but very much in forums where they um, actively advocate for their thinking. Mm -hmm. But as Snowy suggests, there are many, many schools who perhaps also feel pressure because of NAPLAN and literacy and numeracy being pushed as being the vital things that they have to address and be accountable for, that sometimes these things do drop off. Yeah, I have to say as a qualifier, all, all, all schools are invited, um, but, you know, a lot of, the, and sometimes it's a whole school activity, but in a lot of schools, especially at the high school um, and college level, it is a, you know, extracurricular activity that requires a dedicated teacher who's willing to give up lunchtime. So not perfect in the ACT either. We're, we're certainly lobbying or arguing for it to be, um, you know, uh, a wider, more easily available. And in the ACT, we do have the chance to do that, I think. But um, yeah, it's not perfect here I either. Think, but I, yeah. I think a lot of the people who are online, like David Butler, Cam McKenzie, Lorraine Larry, um, if Mark Caddy's there, we all remember a time when we had a policy, a national statement for environmental education that was an enabler for many, many more per uh, pertinent and meaningful things to have occurred. And unfortunately, this is perhaps what we don't have anymore at that federal level, is a policy that we can put on a leadership team's desk and say, this is part of a valued curriculum of Australia. So that is very unfortunate. Yeah. But David, was, you're the very yeah, camp just, there. Just, just add to that, that, and that did not come from within education. It came from, it came from the issue of Peter Wood Department of Environment. And maybe the way forward isn't through education department, it's through outside organisations who, who have a free, a freer minds to engage with it. And how we bring, bring the connect with those people to come in and, and be part of the change. As we do in schools, we work in the community to have change in the school. I think, I think we do, do it at all levels. That's, that's the situation in the ACT. 
the um, sustainable schools sit in the environment um, department, not in the education department, and, and people feel that's a, a, a better match to a certain ex extent. Um, I was just going to say about this, the parliament thing, um, I think last time about 37, 40 schools um, participated in the Youth Parliament on Sustainability, but it really matches, ties into the curriculum in the civics and citizenship stuff, but a major evenly barrier in either schools participating and the same with other sorts of PD is, is getting release time for the teachers. And unless you've got a sympathetic principal, which it means you need to target the principals as well to have an understanding of the worth of education for sustainability in, in lots of different areas to actually get them on board that they will provide the least time needed for the teachers to take their kids out. Going back to departments, Monica's just commented here in the New South Wales um, context, Sustainable Schools New South Wales has just moved from OEH, the Office for Environment and Heritage, to, would you believe, A squared, E squared, New South Wales. So Thank things you. are different in every state and territory. In South Australia, it's the Natural Resource Management Board, um, Mount Lofty, um, Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges that drive the sustainability initiatives in South Australia. Western Australia still has it in the Department of Education. Northern Territory doesn't have it at all. Queensland really doesn't have it at all. Uh, ACT, as you said, it's with the Office, uh, Department of Environment. And Victoria, of course, it's supported by um, the Department of Environment and it's run through a range of outsourced providers. And, and what, we, what we do is, 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 is work through that and get, make sure it keeps on going, going through and just working out how, how we do that. Because we, we consciously in South Australia knew that in the education department, it was wavering a bit. So we actually talked to the uh, NRM board and said, this is, we've got a package for you and they took it on board. We're now talking with Sir Hugh and other people about where, where it goes now. So, so, so it's continually changing how we, how we do it, how we connect with it. And we just can't, as soon as you leave it some, some place, it's, it's, it, can be over, it can be overridden. And therefore, and therefore you actually have, have to continue to work out where it's placed. And, and that's the beauty of the area we, we're thinking in, that, that, that it's people like us who actually are the people who, who are keeping it going, it's, it, it isn't done by, by, by big people in, in, in departments, it's us working, working with them to get it, to get it changed. And therefore, that, we should be aware of that and, that, and, 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 and that's what we do. And that's what we do in schools too. And it's like, like it has, to me, it can't be one or two teachers in the school who are, who are the drivers of it. It actually has mm. to be in the school community. So, so, so the school community says, this is how we are. This is who we are. And this is how we're going, this is how we're going, how we're going to live and learn. And that's, and that's, and that's the beauty of the area we're in. It's frustrating, but the thing is, because no one really understands it, we are part mm. of the way forward. Lovely, and it's a really nice way that you've put that, David. <laughs> Everyone, we have about four minutes left. Um, so the last discussion point was about enough. What is enough? When will we know when it's enough? And is what we're doing enough? So um, I'd like to open it up, and perhaps if anyone who has not had a voice so far might like to contribute, that would be lovely. Hi, Angelo, it's Cam here. You won't see me because our bandwidth is ridiculously small. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ours is very small. Too. No one's seen me for the whole thing. So go for it, Cam. Uh, just a quick question. If anyone is from New South Wales with regards to that first uh, the, the question before, from the implementation of the Climate Clever program that's working in schools and communities around different regions in New South Wales, has anyone had direct experience with the Climate Kettle Lever program that finished about three or four years ago? Yes, Ken. Yeah, I was just asking if anyone has any reflections on that and how effective it was with regards to um, having that long-term sustainable embedded change and looking at the climate education agenda that we're talking about.
take that as a no because I can't hear any responses. So that's fine. Moving on. There's a new one that's um, being proposed, uh, climate ready, that's coming, you know, is being scoped in Victoria as well, which is more around adaptation at this point in time. But Climate Clever, Mark and Victoria, Vicky Whitehouse um, were the instigators in that. And I'm sure there's some research that was undertaken. So um, I'd encourage you perhaps to talk with Mark or email Vicky or do a bit of a Google search on their re the research. And um, I do recall have been, it was evaluated and reviewed. Yep, but I've any other report. ideas about what's enough and... Is what we're doing enough? Gosh, that's like I personally, that's like how a piece of string sort of question, isn't it? Really, <laughs> it is. And this one, as you can tell, is a Hillary Whitehouse question because I know Hillary really wants us to start, start acknowledging that we're in the Anthropocene yeah. and that climate change is our issue to own and to act on. And um, she really wants us all to acknowledge that it's one that transforms outrage into passionate action and um, perhaps if that's what this moment requires of us a reclamation of power of taking back matters into our own hands it might be you know a way forward for us all to consider what this association and what we as individuals in a squared e squared can do because um yeah lorraine Hillary and I presented with Snowy last year at the A squared E squared biennial conference, which was so fantastic in South Australia around the Anthropocene. And it really is um, one that enables us to transform that outrage into passionate action. Well, I think, you know, the answer to the first one is it's enough. I think, you know, if you, if you consider that climate change is, you know, an, an equity issue as well, for some people, it will never be enough what we're, we're doing. So you have to sort of target those, you know, most vulnerable in terms of that perception of whether we're, we're doing enough. And I think the answer clearly is we're not doing enough um, in terms of climate change big picture. Um, and, and changing that. One of the thoughts I, I just had a moment ago is, you know, whether we should be looking for unlikely partners in unlikely places for real change to take place. Because I just think about, you know, the recent events with same-sex marriage, which looked as though it was, you know, you know, a very uh, intractable problem, and one of those wicked problems to overcome. And yet we've got this, you know, wave of change coming through. And if you look at some of the players in, in that change, you know, I was, you go, geez, I would never have thought so-and-so, you know, that, that's one of those things where you've got people who cut through you know, on that issue. And, and maybe we just keep looking for supporters and collaborators in the same place, which is, you know, I think I couldn't hear um, everything that you said, Dave, David, because the sound, but, you know, maybe that's, uh, that's something we need to take into to account is, um, no, it's not enough. We should be doing more and we should be looking at new ways of working and looking to new people to collaborate with or to new places and groups to collaborate with. Well, I know we're going to have to sign off very shortly because we're going over uh, 5.30, but if people have not seen Dumbo Feather, they've got a little booklet called Use Your Power, Eight Ways to Act on Climate Change at the Moment. And it's really quite a powerful one about using your consumer power, using your political power, using your social power and starting with yourself. And uh, it definitely talks about, as you said, finding some different partners like your banks and switching um, your superannuation funds to those that do not invest in fossil fuels. Um, yeah, talking to your banks, looking at what you buy, influencing your local council, joining a political party or climate action subgroup um, and getting the conversations going as we have today. So on behalf of everyone who's joined us, and I think there are 67 people who have chatted um, on our little chat box. I think we had 16 people join us. On behalf of Hilary Whitehouse, who I'm, I'm fortunate to say that she is not um, very well at this point, but on behalf of Snowy, Jennifer and myself, I'd really like to say thank you so much for joining our learning circle this afternoon. And I hope we can keep the conversation going and um, really drive climate change as a topic for 2018 and onwards. So Snowy and Jen, is there anything you'd like to add? 
again. Thank you everyone for um, attending and I hope that you have um, enjoyed it and got something out of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone's saying thank you and that uh, they've enjoyed today. So that's really cool. So <laughs> Thanks, Angela. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. And we hope that um, you can join us for our biannual conference next year. Join us in our learning circles in 2018. And, of course, um, enjoy our Aussie news and bulletins and stay.